just give folks a, a minute to file in. Our registration was at 996. So we'll see. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just gonna launch into some quick announcements. Um, greetings everyone, my name is Rachel Hasna and I am uh, with UNM's Department of Psychiatry Division for Community Behavioral Health. Thank you for joining our Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. Um, so in terms of CEUs, uh, in about the last couple of minutes of the presentation, I will add a link for uh, an evaluation, copy and paste or click on the link, uh, fill out the evaluation and a certificate is automatically generated for you. It is your responsibility to save a copy. So if you're on your smartphone, please take a screenshot. Uh, if you're on your computer, you'll just save it. Um, if you're joining us by phone, you can send us an email and we will email you the link. I know several people have emailed us over the weekend. Uh, I, you, our university was under some kind of cyber attack. And so uh, we apologize for any inconvenience. Registration, the link should be working. So if you have any issue registering or getting a confirmation for future dates, I would just retry registering. Um, and the PowerPoint slides, this is being recorded. The PowerPoint as usual will be emailed out by the end of the week, beginning of next week. So take it away, Julie. Thanks, Rachel. Welcome everyone to the University of New Mexico Law and Mental Health Didactic Series. This series is hosted by the University of New Mexico Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences and the New Mexico Behavioral Health Services Division. We're so glad to have you all here to join us today. My name is Julie Bravko. I'm an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences. Uh, first, I want to announce that we are accepting applications for our Forensic Postdoctoral Fellowship. We have two spots available for the 2021-2022 year. Our brochure is ready to go. Uh, email me if you'd like a copy. Next, I want to remind you to join us next week. At that time, David Lay will be presenting Forensic Misuse of Sex Addiction Diagnosis and Treatment. Uh, for questions that you may have for today's talk, we'll generally be holding them until the end, um, but please ask them anytime you feel comfortable. Um, for those of you that are on a tight schedule but still need your CEUs, we will let you know when that hour has passed, but we will likely be staying on a little bit longer to address questions. So now it's time for what we've all been waiting for. I'd like to introduce to you our speaker for today, Jerry Kucher. Dr. Kucher earned his doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of Missouri. He previously served as chief of psychology at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, and as health, health sciences dean at Simmons and DePaul Universities. He remains a senior associate in psychology at Children's Hospital and lecturer at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Kucher is the founding editor of the journal Ethics and Behavior, and he previously served as editor of the Journal of Pediatric Psychology and the Clinical Psychologist. He's published more than 350 articles and book chapters and authored or edited 17 books, including Ethics and Psychology and the Mental Health Professions, the Psychologist Desk Re Reference, and the Parent's Guide to Psychological First Aid. He's earned five specialty diplomas from the American Board of Professional Psychology and holds active psychology licenses in Illinois, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire. He served as APA president in 2006 and currently serves on the boards of directors for APA divisions 29 and 42. Dr. Kucher, on behalf of the University of New Mexico, the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences, and New Mexico's Behavioral Health Services Division, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for presenting today. We're so grateful for your time and expertise, and I'm now gonna turn it over to you. Thank you, Julie. And on behalf of myself and all the people who are tuning in to these CE workshops, 
Um, I want to express my gratitude to Rachel and to you and to the whole team for putting together this wonderful series from which I have learned a lot and which I'm sure is benefiting our colleagues a great deal. Happy election day, everyone. And I'm glad to try to provide a, a distraction with a small slice of discussion on forensic ethics. And I'm gonna skip over the bio because Julie has already told you about this. And I'm gonna tell you that I have no financial relationship uh, in anything that I'm going to try to sell you. But I do own a US trademark for the term psychoplackery and I hope they'll buy the book when it comes out describing discredited treatments in the mental health profession. Hey, Jerry, do you mind um, going into presentation mode for your PowerPoint? Am I not in presentation mode? Yeah, we, we see the slides and the, and the slide deck. Hold on, display settings, swap. How's that? Oh no, that shows our your presenter mode. So you just want to go to there. You go. You're you're good there. Is this is this what you were looking for? Yes. Cool. Thank you. And uh, all of the views that you're going to hear express are solely my own. So blame me for them, which people always do. Um, what I've done is condensed into a 50 minute format. What I hope will be some interesting selected ethical challenges. Uh, my colleagues and I have previously done this in a whole day format, so I tried to pick some that I thought would cut across interest for both experienced practitioners and novices, and that includes talking about how we think of maintaining our confidence and rigor uh, and avoiding different types of biases that could creep into our work. Also, thinking about the ethical risks involved when you serve as an invisible expert that is an undisclosed forensic expert. Uh, also, I'm gonna talk about handling complex confidentiality issues, including some twists and turns in mandated reporting that will crop up across jurisdictions, especially if you're thinking of uh, providing online services and have to worry about someone sitting in another state who you may owe some obligations or may have to breach confidentiality with. And finally, I thought I would address some interesting fee setting issues uh, regarding forensic practice on a private uh, basis. Uh, and I will stay around to answer questions at the end for as long as you want. And as you see here, um, he does have a license to do that. And uh, most, most of us who are mental health practitioners have a generic license that allows us to practice ethically at the top of what we're allowed to do but we are also expected to be very conservative in how we evaluate ourselves. And this could be a big mistake given the Kruger-Dunning effect. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the concept. Kruger and Dunning uh, have published a whole series of studies showing cognitive biases in which people of low ability overestimate their ability related to a kind of cognitive bias of illusory superiority, as they call it, which comes from the inability of people to recognize their lack of ability. And because of what one of the twists in forensic psychology, where you have to, at least on some level, be willing to expose your opinions to others in the open, which one doesn't always do in the private practice of psychotherapy, um, you are open to more criticism and you may be subject to more personal grandiosity than ought to play the case. So there are lots of things that I don't do, even though I might be able to fake it or get away with it, uh, just because I don't um, feel a level of confidence in those areas. For example, I very much enjoyed the recent talk um, in this series on death penalty mitigation, but I stay away from death penalty uh, work and actually largely from criminal work. Uh, these are my areas of expertise that you see. I've done a lot of child custody work, uh, including serving as a court appointed guardian ad litem and as a parent coordinator in post-divorce situations. I've done a lot of consulting to litigation on disability and damages, including wrongful death torts and uh, the consequences to survivors. 
I frequently serve as a medical expert in disability cases, including for the Social Security Administration. And I do a lot of work in the professional liability area involving medical liability, mental health liability, and uh, licensing board cases. So what do I mean by the invisible or undisclosed expert? No, this is not exactly what I mean, but you get the point. Uh, it's an interesting niche because unlike psychologists, lawyers can shop for experts who agree with them. And uh, that's because they're advocates. They don't have to be behavioral scientists who are interested in the whole truth and laying out behavioral science. So they don't necessarily have to uh, reveal the identity of everyone they're consulting. And in fact, uh, they will only name as consulting experts people whose opinions they like. Uh, so uh, what often happens, and I'm sure many of you had the same experience, you get a telephone call from an attorney who lays out a few uh, points in a case and asks you what your opinion is. And 90% of the time, you're going to say, well, uh, I need to know the details or I need to know more, in which case the attorney will retain you for a period of time, send you a bunch of uh, material to read and ask you to, to call them back when you've read it all, but not to put anything in writing. Well, that's because they don't want it to be subject to discovery. And if they don't like what you have to say, They'll say it was nice talking to you, send me a bill for your time and destroy what you have. They are perfectly entitled to do that. Uh, and so what are some of the roles that I've been involved in? Just as an example, I am often called by attorneys representing people before licensing boards and they have a hearing coming up and they want to know how to present their case. Sometimes uh, attorneys will engage in the strategy of spoiling an expert by retaining and consulting them by never using their advice or disclosing the consultation. And so doing the expert can't be retained from the other side. Suppose, imagine for example, that you are an expert on um, uh, eyewitness testimony perhaps Elizabeth Loftus, perhaps another highly visible person in the area, the geographic area where they're going to tap their expert from. They might, the attorney might hire you for an hour of your time, use your consultation services, and then never use them. Why? Because they don't want you working for the other side. So when the other side calls you and identifies the case, you have to say, I'm sorry, I can't work for you without giving the reason this conflict of interest. Uh, another issue that frequently comes up is my client is gonna come before the licensing board. These are the allegations. What should we write in our response letter? How should we approach the licensing board? What should our stance be? And, and again, you get into some very interesting issues. How about strategies for cross-examination of another psychologist? Strategies for jury selection? strategies on what data to ask for. The attorney thinks they have a case, but the claimant has been seen by a mental health professional or a number of mental health professionals. What should they be asking for? This is also a phenomenon that's going to take place if you do any kind of a psychological assessment or any kind of tort litigation. You know, as a forensic expert, or you should know, that once you've turned in your report and once the report has been shared with the opposing side, you're going to get a request not only for your report, but for all the underlying data, which you are going to have to provide with a waiver from the client. And all of that data in your report is probably going to be sent to several other uh, depending on the scope of the case, but one other expert psychologist or several other expert psychologists. This is particularly going to be the case if it's a neuropsychological evaluation where some residual injury is the target of the litigation. And you have to be aware 
that some other colleague is going to be reading your report and looking at your data and then making suggestions to the attorney that has retained them about what to ask you in a deposition or how to poke holes in your testimony at trial. The slope can become slippery for people who compromise ethical principles while you're doing this consultation. Probably the biggest slippery slope, which the ethics committees and licensing boards have encountered in recent years is coaching. An attorney wants to hire a psychologist to coach someone for an upcoming disability evaluation or an upcoming parenting evaluation, or an upcoming uh, evaluation for damages of some sort. And they, how will, the co how will the coaching take place? Well, maybe they're going to show you some test items. Obviously they're violating test security. Obviously coaching someone on how to take a psychological test so as to present oneself in a particular way undercuts all of the validity criteria that we're looking for and so is probably unethical per se but there are people who go for that do you want to help someone look um psychotic on a rorschach sure i could tell you that i could help you fake that on a rorschach very easily you know the rorschach is coming just see lots of explosions blood and bacteria also letters of the alphabet, all bad things to see on a Rorschach test. Um, but fortunately, people aren't using Rorschachs these days very much for forensic purposes. And we'll talk about why that is in a little while. But these types of advising or undercover advising for um, attorneys is a significant area of practice for many psychologists. So here is uh, the ethical challenge. Is it ethically permissible to help discredit the work of a colleague, raise reasonable doubt, or shift the preponderance of the evidence while remaining invisible? Well, nothing is written in stone and um, anyone could become Voldemort. But I'm going to give you uh, an example of a situation where I was asked to do that and where my invisibility subsequently disappeared. And I got a very angry call from a psychologist colleague in a neighboring state. Um, why did you help them? Well, this was a, an attorney that I worked with frequently. Uh, he was trying a case in New Hampshire and it was a child custody dispute. An unnamed New Hampshire psychologist who had evaluated various parties in the case got on the witness stand and said, among other things, that if this child were placed in the custody of parent X, there was a 50% chance that the child would have a nervous breakdown. There was a recess and the attorney called me and repeated that statement. When I finished laughing, I suggested a couple of questions that the attorney might ask on cross-examination, such as what is the DSM code or the ICD code for a nervous breakdown? Uh, and once the psychologist explained their meaning, uh, could then say, well, doctor, so you're telling me that your evaluation has the same probability of success as a coin flip? because obviously saying there's a 50% probability of something happened is a coin flip probability. So of course the psychologist was very much embarrassed uh, by these questions on cross-examination and the judge essentially discredited the testimony of the psychologist who later learned that I had consulted with the attorney and called me to yell at me on the phone uh, saying among other things, that I had helped to discredit the profession, to which my response was, no, you did that on your own. I was just holding up the magnifying glass. So again, is it ethically permissible? What are the circumstances? When do you want to get involved? How would you draw a line about your willingness to come in and help 
advance the science and the fundamentals of the profession when something is going wrong in the system with psychological or mental health testimony. The key is to remain rigorous. Yes, we must retain our professional integrity uh, and scientific rigor. She's looking right at me now. The social value of presenting psychological data in our justice system depends on respecting the rules of that system. And that includes the integrity of it. So I'm never sad about pointing out defects in or what I think are defects in a colleague's work if I think that their work is undermining the validity of the request that's being made for data that will assist the trier of fact in a forensic case. So the key ethical challenges are understanding the forensic specialty guidelines, and of course also understanding the uh, specialty guidelines that are offered for any practice areas such as child custody. Then I would encourage you all to read Faust. That's not Goethe's Faust, it's David's Faust. Uh, David Faust and Jay Ziskin, as you may know David Faust back in 2011, revised Jay Ziskin, well-known book on coping with psychological and mental health testimony in the courtroom and knowing the pitfalls that are highlighted in that book will help you to stay on the ethical straight and narrow. The key uh, after that is avoiding the trap of confirmatory bias, which you see illustrated here with a blind man poking sharks in and asserting that he has found land. Well, if land is what you're looking for, land is what you think you found. And so the key is to look for all of the evidence, not just the evidence that supports the attorney's presumption. You may end up telling the attorney that the evidence doesn't support their presumption and find yourself out of a job because you're not the lawyer that they want, excuse me, you're not the witness that they want, uh, but that retains your integrity. So the key is providing the whole truth to the extent that we know it and being willing to uh, express an awareness of defects when we see and know them as well. What are the costs of invisibility? Well, you have, you can retain your integrity in most instance, instances by simply not taking the case. But the question is whether you can, um, the information you provide can be used or misused by the expert once you provide it and your invisibility may not last forever. Um, in one recent case, I was approached by an attorney and asked to help discredit some uh, testimony that appeared to result from a memory recovered by an adult in her 20s about having been abused sexually um, during early and middle childhood by a relative. Uh, and this uh, recovered memory, if you will, or reawakened memory occurred during an EMDR, eye movement desensitization reprocessing session. Uh, the attorney was referred to me because I a level two uh, EMDR trained clinician. And I uh, talked to the attorney on the phone and from the attorney's description, the um, psychologist who deployed the EMDR and the context in which the witness remembered the abuse in detail uh, was potentially suspect in the same way that hypnosis and suggestibility might have caused the problem. But being an ever cautious expert, I said to the criminal attorney, let me review the evidence file that you have and I'll tell you whether I think you can be help. I can be helpful to you. In fact, I offered to review the file pro bono. Um, and the attorney sent me about 200 pages of files, 
which included a substantial amount of testimony from other people, not just the person who had recovered the memory with EMDR, as to the culpability of the alleged perpetrator. So in other words, if I were able to help discredit the testimony of this one witness, I might be helping to raise reasonable doubt um, in the case of a defendant who, in my opinion, having read the body of evidence that was piled up, was indeed responsible for the acts described. And I essentially told the attorney, obviously in confidence, um, I can't help you. I think that your guy's best bet might be a plea, a plea bargain. And he was a bit surprised that I wasn't willing to uh, take this on, uh, but um, uh, I, it was just something that I didn't want to touch because clearly I could play a role in raising reasonable doubt for a person who I didn't have confidence in uh, representing in that way. What about my colleagues' feelings? Well, if you plan to step into the forensic arena, prepare to def defend yourself or face the consequences. Ruth would not want you to be naughty. In addition, uh, because of the nature of our work, it's always on the record, unless you're doing a direct consultation privately with an attorney and you're not gonna be disclosed as an expert. It's gonna be on the record. You're gonna be on the witness stand in public. Someone is gonna be taking notes and by definition, everybody involved is familiar with litigation and perhaps prone to litigation. Uh, they know regulatory, civil and criminal enforcement systems. And if you screw up, people are going to know about it and you are going to face the consequences. So stick to solid ethics. How about confidence, rigor, and advocacy biases and psychological testimony? Well, I want you to consider Dilbert's context here, and I'll give you just a minute to read uh, what Dilbert is struggling here with data about everything is wrong. So we'll just guess and make it up. Well, Dilbert can do that, we can't. I always like Dilbert because it leads us into Daubert and how does Daubert guide us? And I'm sure you all know that Dow, standard Daubert uh, issues. You may not know, don't call it Daubert. The family pronounces it Daubert. That's how they pronounce it. And you may want to see where is he now? Today, Jason Daubert in his mid forties works in technology in La Jolla. And if you want to read a story about Jason's biography, you can follow this link and see the interesting story. But as you may know, in the original case, uh, Jason Daubert and Eric Schuler were, of course, just infants. They were born with serious birth defects. You can see uh, Jason's shortened uh, right hand in that uh, picture. And their parents sued Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals, claiming that the drug Bendectin, which was used for hypermesis gravidarum, better known as mor morning sickness, led to birth defects. Well, Merrill Dow's experts submitted documents showing that there was no published scientific studies demonstrating a link between Bendictin and birth defects. Uh, but the evidence provided uh, by Dobert and Schiller included lab studies and animal studies uh, that indicated that high doses of Bendectin might indeed cause problems in animals. The district court granted summary judgment for Merrill Dow and the plaintiffs appealed. Basically, uh, the judges were skeptical that the research had been done solely to promote uh, litigation and they didn't accept it. And that led to the uh, well-known decision that specified that scientific knowledge for your expert testimony has to be grounded in knowledge and scientific data. And it must be aimed at helping the trier of fact 
understand the evidence and determine what's at issue and that the judge is the decider based on, on these principles. Well, uh, after that refresher, you may be uh, thinking, well, how, how does this twist with the Kumo tire? That's actually a Kumo tire up in the corner there. Um, the issue in the Kumo tire case was that Patrick Carmichael's minivan blew, uh, I think it was a left rear tire on the highway, tumbled into a ditch. There was significant uh, medical consequences to that. And the question was, was the Kumo tire to blame? And the challenge was that the expert witness was a technician, not a scientist. And he essentially used elimination, process of elimination. He said, I don't know what caused the defect, but I couldn't find anything. So it must have been a tire manufacturing defect by process of elimination, something that the court found to be a disputed methodology. Uh, the appeals court had let the Daubert evidence in because they didn't discriminate between technical data and scientific data, but the Supreme Court reversed saying that the standard in Dalbert applied to technical evidence as well. So moving forward, where does that take us today? There is new research uh, that was published earlier this year by Tess Neal and her colleagues. And it highlighted the fact that nearly all assessment tools that psychologists offer in legal evidence uh, have been uh, subjected to empirical testing, although they've been, it's, only about 67% qualify as generally accepted. Only about 40% have favorable reviews for psychometric properties. The relationship between general acceptance and favorability of the tools and their psychometric properties is often weak and that legal challenges are rare. Challenges to assessment evidence for any reason occurred in are only around 5%. And those were challenges to validity of the data. So the question here for you is if you choose to use an assessment tool and something that is going to be a part of your expert testimony, are you prepared to cite the validity, the standard error of measurement and other uh, psychometric properties of your uh, underlying instrument if the cross-examiner has the sophistication to read Faust and Ziskin and come after you on that point. So when challenges were raised, they only succeeded about a third of the time and uh, that most scientifically suspects, uh, challenges to even the most suspect tools were almost non-existent. And attorneys rarely challenge the expert assessment instrument, probably because they're not equipped to do so unless you as an invisible expert help them. And judges are often reluctant to apply scrutiny to this um, with due respect to the judicial community. It requires a lot of work and it requires someone to organize the data in a way that the uh, courts can understand. And that's the, the reference to Tess Neal's uh, study. If you have not already seen it, it's well worth looking at. And it, it gets back to the fundamental question that if you're going to use psychological test data in your forensic testimony, have a good idea in mind of what the question is that you want the data to answer. Don't just go throwing a lot of instruments at a case, yes, that will increase your billable hours, but just throwing instruments at a case isn't going to help you unless the, the potential result of that instrument goes directly to a legal question. So how about novel circumstances? And this is an interesting situation. How about a case of first impression? Any of you ever been involved in a case of first impression? Um, I'm old enough to have done that a couple of times, but you have to ask yourself what legal questions apply, what psychological data will help you answer the questions, and how can I apply my valid and scientific reasoning to help the court? So I'm going to give you a fast example of two cases. One was a case working at Boston Children's Hospital 
where we were asked to consider a bone marrow donation for, uh, from a sibling for a sibling. The patient had aplastic anemia, uh, a disease which was going to kill him without a bone marrow transplant. And he had a younger sibling who was a good match, but the parents could not consent to the five-year-old uh, being a donor, one child to the other. There had to be a court-appointed process, a substituted judgment process. I was asked as a psychologist, well, can you interview the uh, potential donor, the five-year-old donor, and ascertain what they would choose to do if they were legally competent to do it? There were no tests that would help me um, except perhaps a, a, an uh, expressive vocabulary, receptive vocabulary tests. Uh, but I did um, a Peabody picture vocabulary test and it turns out the youngster fortunately had, was very verbal and had uh, an IQ uh, in the superior range. And so I asked him what he understood about his brother's situation. And the five-year-old was able to tell me his blood was sick and he could die unless he gets a transplant. And I asked if, if he knew what giving a transplant would mean. And he essentially explained to me in five-year-old terms exactly what had been told to him, which was general anesthesia and a needle inserted into his hip bone to take some blood out. And then he, he responded, but I'll grow my blood back again, my, my, bone, my bone marrow back again. And I said, you know what will happen if your brother doesn't get the transfusion? And he said he, he will probably die. And so I then asked him what he thought about that. And he said, if he dies, I won't have anyone to play with. And then I asked him what he thought he wanted to do. And he said, I want to give it to him. So uh, using uh, an assessment of the child's verbal skills and, and an interview with simple questions, I was able to say in court that there would indeed probably be some likely benefit to the youngster for donating in that case. The guardian ad litem approved the donation of the bone marrow. A more sophisticated uh, case uh, dates back to prior to the decision to allow same-sex marriage. And it's interesting, it involves Dr. Susan Love. Some of you may know about Dr. Love in the 1970s and 1980s when radical mastectomies were the primary treatment for uh, breast lumps that were potentially malignant. Susan Love, who was at the time a breast surgeon at Boston's Beth Israel Medical Center, uh, was one of the people who championed uh, conservative lumpectomies. And uh, what a lot of people don't know about Susan is her um, childbirth and adoption case. Uh, Susan was. Uh, at the time in the 1970s, a life partner with Dr. Helen Cooksey, and they wanted to have a child. And in 1989, Susan gave birth to a daughter conceived from sperm donated by one of Helen's cousins. And then uh, the fun started in the legal system. Here's Susan biologically giving birth to a child, which is genetically somewhat related to our life partner. Now remember, there's no legal same-sex marriage yet in Massachusetts or anywhere else for that matter. And so uh, Dr. Cooksey, Helen Cooksey said she wanted to go into court and adopt the child. By her adopting the child, both she and Susan would have joint parental rights a very novel court decision um, and somewhat controversial in an era when um, the idea of same-sex unions was less than universally accepted. The case went all the way to the Massachusetts Supreme Court and there were psychological um, arguments made. 
And the court actually relied in part on one of them in saying that it saw no barriers to the adoption because one, the biological mother was consenting to the adoption, but two, it was beneficial to the child to have two caring adults willing to step forward, take legal responsibility for that child's welfare. So here was a best interest of the child on a psychological basis that was made. So this is an interesting place where psychology can come into play at times when we have research or knowledge about questions which might otherwise uh, not get past an initial judicial screening because they're unusual. Uh, another issue to think about is uh, APA's feet of clay. This is the backside of psychological testimony. This is when psychologists talk out of both sides of their mouth. Because as you know, in any kind of psychological data set, there are problems. There are studies can always be done. You all, you were all asked at your doctoral dissertation defense. How could you make the study better? What would you have done differently if you did it over? true about almost every piece of psychological research. So how about when psychologists cherry pick or engage in blatant um, ascertainment bias in offering their opinions? And you see here Justice Scalia, because he's the guy who pointed it out, the case was Roper v. Simmons and Hodgson v. Minnesota. And some of you will recognize Roper v. Simmons as the juvenile death penalty case in which the Supreme Court said that the death penalty for juvenile offenders was unconstitutional. And Hodgson, Hodgson v. Miller, which was an abortion uh, rights case. And what APA had done was to, in the Hodgson v. Miller case, argue that minor girls who became pregnant were mature enough to decide, excuse me, were mature enough to decide whether to carry the infant to term or to make a decision about abortion. And in Roper v. Simmons, the APA also wrote an amicus brief and said that juvenile offenders' uh, mental development was still immature at the same age. And uh, so they shouldn't be held responsible with the death penalty. And Scalia, who, as you know, is a constitutional, was a constitutional strict constructionist, spotted this, even though the decisions were years apart. And as you can see, the quote here is referring directly to APA's amicus brief. Uh, and uh, it, it, we claimed that evidence shows that people under 18 lack the ability to take moral responsibility for the decisions. But wait a minute, we took the opposite review in point of view in the earlier Hodgkin v. Minnesota case, where we found a rich body of research showing that juveniles are mature enough to decide whether to obtain an abortion without parental involvement. Well, what is it, one or the other? And uh, APA has numerous treatises, which you can get from the APA website. We filed amicus briefs, but Judge Scalia pointed out that given the nuances of scientific methodology, conflicting views, courts, which can only consider the evidence in front of them, are ill-equipped to determine which view of science is the right one. So here's the, the bias. Are we, when we go into court making a psychological argument, especially in the era where we're in right now, where the world is politicized or America is politicized around many different issues, and we could find um, points critical of this and points critical of that going in opposite directions, what are we going to present? What stance are we going to take as psychologists in front of the court? Confidential, confidentiality also raises some hot issues across jurisdictions because of differences in state mandates when it comes to breaching confidentiality. Who, how we get access to records in the post HIPAA era and patients living and deceased and 
who gets access to what. So APA in general says that um, we're supposed to obey the law. Now there is a, a much maligned section of the current APA ethical code which said, well, if we have a personal disagreement with law or governing authority, we try to resolve things. And some years ago, this was um, read as somehow coding, authorizing psychologists to engage in coercive interrogation. But actually it was put in the ethics code in the 1980s, back in, in the days when I served on the APA ethics committee, because we wanted to help psychologists cope with mandated reporting requirements. And there are different variations. You know, there are in every state protects children by making it mandatory that certain named professions, including physicians, nurses, psychologists, social workers must report uh, suspicion or knowledge of child abuse. Same thing for elderly abuse in most states. Same thing for the abuse of dependent persons, such as the physically disabled or mentally disabled. In Pennsylvania, psychologists are mandated reporters of unsafe drivers. Um, in Minnesota, there's an interesting twist to the illegal substance use. If one of your patients tells you that they came to Boston for the weekend and tried legal marijuana here in Massachusetts, but now they're back in therapy in Minneapolis, and guess what? I'm pregnant. You, as the psychologist, are a mandated reporter that that woman used marijuana while pregnant. Interestingly, in Minnesota, you only have to approve, you only have to report alcohol use by a pregnant woman if it's excessive, but you have to report any marijuana use. Um, and then there's Title IX. Uh, Title IX uh, is uh, an interesting twist where institutional harassment reporting, although our current Secretary of Education has tried to roll back some of the reporting and hearing mandates. If you're a psychologist on the faculty of a university, not in the counseling service, but in the, on the faculty, on the psychology faculty, and you're talking about harassment and abuse in class, and one of your students raises the hand and, and says something that leads you to believe that they were abused or harassed, or they come by your office and mention that they were abused or harassed, you must report that to the Title IX officer of your university. The chaplaincy office is exempt. The counseling center is, is exempt. But just because you're a psychologist or a social work faculty member on the faculty doesn't make you exempt. So a student who comes after class to talk about you asking a sensitive issue may find themselves getting mandated reported. And in some states, such as Illinois, firearms, owner's identification law, or the New York State SAFE Act, you may be required to report uh, any of your patients who you deem dangerous if they own or have access to a firearm. Uh, in fact, in Illinois, as an Illinois licensed psychologist, if I think one of my patients would be dangerous with a firearm, I have to preempt preemptively put their name in the state police database, uh, whether the client gives me permission or not. So who's abusive? Who do you need to report? Who knows? It may all depend on on where you are and what jurisdiction you're sitting in, but what constitutes abuse, harassment, or reportable events can differ widely across jurisdictions. Still more exceptions to confidentiality, your professional responsibility to protect others and your professional responsibility to protect clients from self-threatening harm, and there are a number of cases, some of you uh, may know, uh, you all know Tarasov, I'm sure. Uh, you may know McIntosh versus Milano or Thompson versus the County Al Alameda, which were essentially duty to protect cases radiating down to children. And you may want to look at them, but I see we only have about 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna pick up the pace here. We can go back and I would be glad to address questions on those if people have them. Still more exceptions to confidentiality. 
health oversight or managed care are authorized under HIPAA. Those are called the TPO, treatment and payment operations under HIPAA. Those exempt some of your health records. Bill collection circumstances. You can you should not disclose client status. You should not disclose the nature of why the person is seeing you. But if you do try to collect a bill and you do use bill collection or small claims court procedures, you can disclose that a person had been your client and you're billing them for mental health services. Uh, if a patient threatens a complaint or a lawsuit or a licensing board complaint, um, you may be able to uh, disclose content of confidential information. And in some states, law enforcement personnel may have access to mental health records. So again, if you're gonna cross state lines, especially in the COVID era, to provide mental health services, you may uh, find yourself uh, dealing with some interesting twists and turns in the law. How about dead people? Do they have confidentiality rights? Well, you recognize her? How about him? That's Martin Orn, Martin Orn. And the woman above him is Ann Sexton. Ann Sexton was in therapy with Martin Norn, who was both a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And uh, Martin Norn uh, taped all of his therapy sessions with Ann. Ann had a problem with alcohol and it led to memory problems. And so she asked that her sessions be tape recorded so that she could re listen to them uh, on her own time. And when she died, uh, Diane Middlebrook undertook a biography of Ann Sexton and talked to Ann's daughter and asked for copies of her daughter from, from Ann Sexton's daughter, who was the executrix of Ann's literary estate. Um, could I get access to your mom's records? And could I talk to your mom's psychiatrist? And this is where it got interesting. The daughter who had the authority to do this granted Middlebrook permission to talk to Orne. And Orne talked to Middlebrook. And not only did Orne talk to Middlebrook, he mentioned the tapes. And Middlebrook said, well, can I listen to the therapy tapes? And Orne said, well, you have permission. So here we have a biographer who's actually listening to the therapy sessions of the person she's doing the biography about. Well, Martin Warren was, of course, excoriated by many of his psychiatric colleagues, but in a forensic sense, he followed the law. Uh, consent was given for the release of this information by the person with authority to give it, and so Warren released the records. How about the case of Swidler and Berlin and James Hamilton versus the United States? Think about this. Have you ever heard of this case before? You may not think so, but if you were more than seven years old in 1997, you certainly did. Recognize him? How about him? How about them? The person on the far left is Vince Foster. The person in the middle is Kenneth Starr. And there you see a young Hillary Clinton with Vince Foster, who was the Clinton family lawyer back in Arkansas. Vince Foster committed suicide in a public park in Washington, D.C. while working as White House counselor when Ken Starr subpoenaed his records. And he had visited his attorney at Swidler and Berlin the evening before he committed suicide. And the uh, investigator, Ken Starr, went to Swidler, Berlin, and Berlin, and James Hamilton, who was the attorney, and demanded release of their records on uh, Vince Foster. And they, the lawyers refused to do so, and Vince Foster's estate refused to release any information about him. And the United States Supreme Court ruled uh, in the uh, opinion written by Rehnquist that the Vince Foster's confidentiality rights were protected by attorney-client privilege even after his death. And they cited the Jaffe v. Redmond decision. For those of you that don't remember Jaffe v. Redmond, that's the case that predict, 
protected the confidentiality of police officer Jaffe's discussions with her social worker uh, after a shooting. That was the US Supreme Court decision that protected all mental health testimony in the United States as privileged and less waived. So the Supreme Court, again, has said that the um, information, the confidential information of dead people can be protected. Uh, the potential likely challenge in some mental health cases might be in cases of testamentary capacity. What do I mean by that? You were treating someone in therapy who changed their will at some point while you were treating them. And after they're dead, the heirs are disputing was undue influence applied by one of the beneficiaries at getting the patient to change their will. And so you might conceivably be called on to testify about your deceased patient's testamentary capacity. But other than that, the secrets of dead people can remain secret. Still more exceptions to confidentiality under HIPAA. HIPAA does respect dead people's confidentiality unless their legal representative releases it as in the Middlebrook case. And uh, it's not required if the psychologist decides in the exercise of reasonable judgment that treating an individual as a personal representative under HIPAA is not in the patient's best interest. How about more confidentiality conundrums? Rest assured, anything you say in this office won't get repeated by me. How about privilege versus mandate? Toe-to-toe -to -toe combat. Psychologist retained by an attorney to evaluate a defendant in a criminal case. During the evaluation, the defendant reports a situation that might trigger a mandated report. He abused his child. He's financially abusing an elderly relative. You tell this, you're the psychologist, you tell this to the attorney who says, guess what? You're all working for me. It's attorney client privilege. You can't say anything. So uh, in this particular case, the attorney has a valid point. So if you are going to be engaged in a case where the, you can possibly foresee some kind of reporting mandate come up, you may want to qualify or to discuss this with the attorney in advance so that you and the attorney are both comfortable with how mandated reporting obligations will be handled in the work that you're agreeing to do. And if you're not comfortable with it, you don't have to agree to do the work. General suggestions, if you have to speak in public about a case, Focus on being accuracy, uh, being accurate, show fairness in your findings and comments, avoid deception, disclose all sources of information, differentiate observations, inferences, and conclusions, and avoid educative, non-educative out of court statements. This is if you've given testimony in court and the testimony was public and you are sought out for comments. Um, I would, in general, not talk to the press, but if the press is interpreting something I said on the witness stand in public wrongly, I would consider uh, an educative out-of-court statement. This, again, refers not to things that are confidential, but things that have been mentioned in open court where there's an effort to follow up on them. How about fees? I'll give you five minutes on fees. Uh, yeah, none, none of us really want to think about that, but uh, when determining fees, you have to consider things like your experience, the time and labor, the novelty or the difficulty, the skill that's needed, the fee that's customarily charged by others, time limits imposed, the nature and length of the professional relationship with the client, the client's ability to pay, and any legal requirements. And then there's always value pricing and the dead squirrel. So the, the question is, can you competently assist with dead squirrels? And if you want to see the story, there it is in Fast Company. There was a dead squirrel under the porch. It was stinky. The guy tried to get it out from under his porch, but he couldn't reach it. And it was very repulsive. 
So he called the dead animal removal service. And the deal was 150 bucks to remove the dead animal, no matter how long it takes. Get rid of it. The guy comes, reaches under the porch with a pole, snatches the carcass of the dead squirrel, throws it in the trash bag, took one minute, $150. Bottom line, if you can charge what the traffic will bear, if you have some special skill that warrants you're doing that, the uh, forensic guidelines tell us that we really have to consider these factors when um, working with clients. And there's a special, uh, two special issues here. Your fee should not be contingent on the outcome of the case. How can you be a dispassionate observer and scientist and uh, expert witness if you have a, an interest in the outcome? And I will refer you to an article on letters of protection if you want to read them. And I'm sorry to accelerate, but I want to leave plenty of time for questions at the end. Uh, no, you cannot just forget about the ethical complexities. These are the references that I referred to. And if you want the slide deck now, if you want everything today, go to my website, which is psychethics.com. And there's a tab that says free resources. And if you click on that, there will be a drop down menu and you can download the entire PowerPoint presentation except for any of the copyrighted cartoons that I flashed in front of you. So sorry to rush through the last part, but I will stay and answer questions. Thank you so much. Um, Jeff Youngren said the CEU website is might be wrong. Rachel, can you look into that while we do questions? It looks like the date might be wrong and there's no title. Um, Okay, do you believe that universities should engage in Title IX investigations and hearings? And if so, do you believe the standard of proof should be raised from preponderance of evidence to clear and convincing evidence, given the seriousness of the outcome of these hearings? Well, what I believe is unimportant because what's really important is that Title IX requires certain things to be done in our current uh, Secretary of Education is uh, somewhat problematic in terms of loosening the requirements. What I personally believe as a forensic psychologist is in due process. And one of the complaints has been in, in some Title IX hearings, um, people aren't granted. Uh, sometimes the accused has not been granted due process or there's been differential processes. So I'm in favor of protecting people from harassment in whatever form it occurs in the workplace, but in a way that respects the rights of all the parties. Thank you. The next question is, what are your suggestions for sending a Brodsky letter when you observe particularly concerning practice or very inaccurate statements in a forensic evaluation? Do you wait until the case has ended and the appeals process has told? Or do you address the issue with the psychologist right away or something else? I am I have no clue what a Brodsky letter is. <laughs> Me either. I know Stanley Brodsky, but I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what is meant by a Brodsky letter. Have you reported a colleague to their licensing board when you were an invisible expert? And how would you determine whether their work was unethical versus poor practice? Who should be making the report to the board, you or the attorney? In my opinion, the, uh, any reports to the board ought to come from the attorney in the case, not from me. It's as though I were in, in some ways a secondhand person. I can tell them the problem, but disclosing uh, the bad behavior to the licensing board might uh, lead to other litigation or might compromise the case in chief that the attorney is dealing with. So I, I'd want to be respectful for that. So we got some clarification. A Brodsky letter is a letter to a colleague inquiring about a questionable practice. Um, in general, if I 
am aware of a colleague doing something that I think is problematic and I am not involved in the case, I will often reach out to that colleague privately and, and with a sort of, did you know that this could be a problem? Did you know that some people might uh, find this um, a difficulty? Uh, I think that's, uh, in general, I've usually been encountered that when I make that as a private comment, uh, usually my colleagues who get that comment have, have seen it as helpful, not hostile. Um, but it, again, it all depends on the circumstances. There, there may be cases when I receive the information about their behavior in confidence. Okay, <clears throat> the next question is, you alluded to psychoquackery, but I think this can be applied to the area of jurisprudence. I've assisted colleagues by purveying referrals for their clients who were about to re relocate to another geographical area. I sometimes came across clinicians who I thought looked like mountebanks because they had the academic credentials, uh, but they were, although they had the academic cr credentials, they were in some way suspect in their methodology, et cetera. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but with respect, are there statistics regarding what percent of therapists are in some way not up to par? I don't know of any statistics on that, but I can give you an example uh, that will make you very happy. You, you may not know this, and I apologize if I offend anyone, but I'm intending to be offensive. There are some psychologists who do past life regression therapy. They help you by getting in touch, by helping you get in touch with your past lives and resolve conflicts that you might have had in a previous life. And by the way, you can get board certified in past life regression therapy. So go right ahead and search Google and you'll find that. And you'll find some of the people who are listed as board certified in past life regression therapy are licensed psychologists. Hmm. I wonder what that means. So th there are people who are publicly out there doing it. One, one I, 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 and I, the, what we're doing in the Psychoquackery book is we're listing Lots of things that people have used or are using. One of my favorites is, is asking parents of autistic children spend significant amount of, amounts of money to have their autistic child swim with dolphins. Really? Uh, do you think putting an anxious autistic kid in the water with a large marine mammal is going to help with the autism? No, I'm sorry. Um, and you, so that there are all manner of interesting things which people are doing in the name of mental health, which are really not validated. The next question is, um, if the client is deceased due to suicide and the client's family wants to ask the clinician about the client's experience in therapy or wants their file, what should you ask before you release? Written authorization and from whom? That's a, that's a wonderful question. And, and it's a question that you should address first with uh, your, um, uh, depending on which insurance company you have, if you have um, an insurance company that provides you with free good legal consultations, such as the trust, talk with someone, um, the suicide of a client is one of the most devastating things that can happen to the clinician. What an insult to your work as a therapist if you couldn't keep your client alive. I'm talking about in the psychodynamic narcissistic insult point of view. So it's a blow to you as a therapist as well as the family. Uh, a lot depends on the level of detail in your records. Um, I'm, I'm going to use an example uh, of a, of a I had a patient commit suicide while in the hospital. Uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to disguise the details to, to really protect the fact. Let's just say that the patient had a, a terminal illness and had a number of family issues going on at home. And we recognized the seriousness of the illness. And we actually had a nurse sitting by the bedside of this patient who was a young adult he tricked the patient, the nurse, into leaving the room for a minute and went out a window on the seventh floor. 
And it's one of the reasons, by the way, why most hospitals you visit will not have windows that open from the inside. Um, now, in the record, there were lots of notes about my interventions with him and uh, our efforts to get him antidepressant medication and our orders to have a nurse sitting by the bedside and, and so forth. There was no mention in the medical record about how he felt about certain family members who were doing things and saying things that were helping to increase his depression. So if those family members wanted to see the record, they could have seen it and they could have accessed it in Massachusetts under state law, but I wasn't putting things in the record that would be harmful to one of the survivors to see. Um, that said, you also want to get guidance from your colleagues about what to say to families, express your sadness for their loss. Don't say, I'm sorry. Don't say, I wish I were a better therapist. Again, even if all of those things are true, uh, you don't say those things. Instead, you try to be empathic toward it. Don't be like certain public figures who only see think the world as it affects them we've seen on television lately. Instead, have empathy for the family, but don't make statements which might become the fodder for civil lawsuit against you. And I hope that's those comments are generally helpful. Thank you. Um, for those of you that are still on, we are working on getting that CEU link fixed. Um, please save it and try it in about an hour or tomorrow. Um, but I promise you we're working on it. We know there's some issues with it. Just give us a little bit of time. Um, yeah, and I'll make sure to, to extend the expiration. I just, for some reason, the changes need to go through our red cap administrators. So don't panic. It'll be available in an, in an hour or so. And so thanks. All right. Uh, the next question is, can you briefly comment on the ethics of certifying an emotional support animal for your patient? Don't do it. Uh, uh, now, you know, Jeff Youngren and I and others have written on this. Why do I say don't do it? It puts you in a dual role relationship position. Uh, say, I would say to a patient who asked me that, you know, I'm, if, if, if I'm seeing you in therapy, my goal is to help you as a therapist. If you want me to do, do find the most supporting animal, I would have to evaluate you. Or I would have to take what I know about you and say, you are emotionally disabled. And if I say you are emotionally disabled in a letter, I'd have to say it in my clinical notes. And that could come back to bite you. Suppose you decide to enlist in the military to sign up to be a police officer or a firefighter to seek a security clearance, to apply for disability insurance, and they ask for your record, and your record says in it that you're emotionally disabled, which is what one would have to do to qualify under ADA for a support animal. Do you want that following you around? So uh, find someone else who's willing to do an evaluation of you and say you're mentally disabled and that you need this animal and um, but I have a dual relationship. I'm, as, as your therapist, I'm here to work with you in therapy, not to sort out that. You don't want it to come back and bite you. And just for everyone that's still on, um, Dr. Youngren does a great talk on that. So maybe we can convince him to, to come back at a later date and, and present for us again. Um, the next question is, if you do run into the situation where a client reports something to you as the psychologist that would require mandated reporting and the lawyer tries to argue it's underprivileged, which ethical practice would be prioritized? If, if, if the lawyer tells you that the information you received was received under legal privilege, then uh, you should get a consultation from your own attorney, or if you're insured with the trust, you can 
reach an attorney familiar with your state law free of charge who will tell you whether you're covered or not uh, under that circumstance. But I would not simply violate it and report it without getting um, an independent legal consultation. You don't want to put yourself in jeopardy. Along those same lines or similar lines, what if the court ordered an evaluation or in a court ordered evaluation, um, the criminal evaluee reveals potentially reportable information? What would you do? In a court ordered evaluation, your client is the court. And so it, it might depend on the, um, uh, the specific nuances if you, if the court orders you to report under seal, then you could say at the end of your report, you could ask, it's going to the judge, you could ask the judge, um, should I report this information or not? But again, court ordered lets you out of the hook of arguing with the lawyers because the judge is the consumer, the court is the consumer. Would you share your thoughts on mitigation evaluations in death penalty cases? You mentioned your ethical concerns in this area at the start of the presentation. Um, I didn't intend to frame my concerns as ethical concerns. Uh, they were more personal competence concerns. Um, I enjoyed that lecture that we all got on the death penalty mitigation, but I don't feel competent to conduct those evaluations nor do I feel knowledgeable about the issues involved. So those are not the type of cases that I would personally take on. I, I limit my scope of practice. And so that's, I was using that as one example. Okay, if you report abuse to a state agency during the process of a forensic evaluation and the examinee knows you're the one who reported the abuse, are there conflict of interest or other ethical concerns that should lead to a recusal from that case? Um, uh, it, it, you, it's like you're handing me an artichoke and asking me about one of the leaves that's three layers down. Um, I'll try to parse it for you. If I am doing a court ordered evaluation or some non-private evaluation where I have a mandated report, or if in general in my practice, I, I'm doing psychotherapy with someone who this actually happened one time, the parent took off her shoe and whacked the kid during a, a mother child therapy session. Uh, and the kid was bleeding in his head and we had to take him down to the emergency room, unfortunately needed only a stitch or two. But I had to say to the mother, I am required under law to report this to the State Child Protection Agency, but I know this is out of character for you and I'm willing to continue working with you as your therapist and I'll tell them that you're working with therapy, but I have to report it. So here's a case where you are telling the person that you're going to have to report it. A more dangerous case would be in Illinois, where you have a patient who you would have to list in the state, um, that state police database as someone who shouldn't have a gun, and you know that they want to get guns and they can acquire them or they can go across the state line to Indiana and get them. Um, fortunately, that uh, the, my reporting of that to the Illinois State Police, which is required under Illinois law, I'm sitting in Illinois, with my Illinois license at that time, that's protected. So there are challenges. If, if I have a patient in my office who's brandishing a gun and threatening to go shoot someone to whom I might have a Tarasov protection obligation, yes, I'm gonna exercise the protection obligation, but I'm gonna wait till they're out of the office with the gun and I'm going to be sure the police know to get that person and get the gun away from them. If, uh, so again, they'll, they'll know where it came from, but um, they're not gonna do it in the moment. If you report abuse, oh, no, sorry. I just read that one too. The next one is, does it matter if your notification or advisement in a forensic evaluation is oral only versus written? 
Um, I would always want to have uh, both oral and written. Now, I realize that in this current COVID era, it may be a challenge, but you could still have your written consent form and email that information form to the client. And then you could ask the client during part of your Zoom session with them, you could turn on the recorder and say, did you read and understand that information that I sent you? And then shut off the recorder and you've captured the consent. So I would always try to document uh, and capture the consent in some way. Even if it's if you can't get the person to initial the form, in the worst possible case, you say, in your record, I provided Mr. Jones or Ms. Smith with consent, and I'm putting a copy of the form in their record. Again, uh, they may say, oh, I never saw that, or that wasn't explained to me, but at least you have some evidence that you made a good faith effort to provide that information. All right, thank you so much. This was fantastic. We got a lot thank of you. really positive feedback from, from okay. people. And Have people. a great day, stay well. Thank you. And for everyone, again, in the chat, we have the link posted. Just go ahead and copy and paste that into a Word document. We'll get that fixed as soon as possible. I recommend maybe um, trying in a, an hour or so, maybe tomorrow morning. We'll extend the amount of time that you have to complete it. If there are any issues, um, please email us. Rachel, do you have anything you want to add about that? Nope, it, it should be up in, a, in an hour or so. We're just waiting for the approval. So sorry about that, y'all. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jerry. And thanks, Cara. It was great to have you. All right, well, thanks. Hopefully, if anybody needs anything, please just send me an email. All right, okay. bye guys.